last of Egypt's great pharaohs. A warrior. A master strategist. And then, one night, King Ramses III met his match. In the place he expected at least. Now, 3,000 years later, an archaeologist turned detective is cranking up the heat in a new investigation and will lift the veil on the death of Ramses III. Was it natural causes or murder? In 1153 BC, ancient Egypt. Ramses III arrives at his palace in Thebes for a huge celebration. He's led Egypt for 30 years and he's showing signs of wear and tear. This 20-day festival is designed to rejuvenate the aging pharaoh's vitality. Dozens of harem wives kick off the celebration inside the Medinet Habu Palace. <laughs> but there's a dark side to the festivities. A minor queen is up to no good. Queen T, a trusted wife of Ramses for many years. Ancient records point to her as a murder suspect, and she's got a motive. rival, Queen Isis, is Ramses's chief wife. So her son stands ready to inherit the throne. Queen T wants her own son, Pentaware, to be the next pharaoh. And like most ambitious mothers, she'll do just about anything to help her son. Even stage a coup. Night falls, Ramses arrives, and the palace comes alive. Queen T and her cohorts have waited patiently. It's time to set their plan in motion. There's no turning back. What happens next will change history. Susan Redford, a distinguished Egyptologist, wants to figure out exactly what did happen that night. But it won't be easy. There's no single account and lots of conflicting information. Ramses was a bundle of contradictions. He was a giant in battle who crushed Egypt's invaders. Yet he never suspected that his most dangerous enemies were right at his side. He was a powerful and charismatic leader, but as the last of the great pharaohs, even he couldn't save Egypt. Redford's investigation turns up the unmistakable signs of a crumbling empire. Ramses' Egypt had tumbled into economic decline. In the streets, his people were starving. The pharaoh lived in glorious extravagance with magnificent palaces and countless servants. No one could have imagined this disaster 100 years earlier, during Egypt's golden years. The craftsmen and laborers who built the dazzling royal tombs and temples were rewarded with generous salaries and decent living conditions. But under Ramsey's watch, the kingdom weakens and goes broke. Egypt loses access to key trading routes and essential materials like iron. Without the raw materials, 
they can't compete. Money dries up, and the government stops paying workers for their services. With no food or supplies, a middle class that once lived comfortably now must get by on scraps. An ancient text documents one worker's plea. We are extremely destitute. Truly, we are already dying. Many believe Ramses either doesn't know or doesn't care about their misery. But Queen T does know and plots to use the growing hostility to her advantage. As evening heats up and the pharaoh winds down, Queen T's allies, both in and out of the palace, set their plan in motion and begin to close in on Ramses. First century Egypt, the Cairo Museum. The final stop for Ramses III, Egypt's last great pharaoh. Susan Redford has been investigating Ramses' death for years, but she's never been face to face with a 3,000 year old king. Now, she finally has the chance for an autopsy of sorts. And she's brought along one of the world's leading mummy experts, Dr. Salima Ikram, to help her read the mummy. It, it's absolutely astounding to me to actually look into the face of Ramses III. Marvelous. Beautifully preserved. I'm curious as to how his being so tightly wrapped, how we can tell that he was quite an obese man. I expected to see some folds of skin. Even after 3,000 years, Salima can tell that Ramses lived luxuriously. Um, well, no, I, do, I don't really see any folds of skin. He's a little bit jowly. And if you look at his face, his, his bones look quite broad, and he does look a little bit plumper than um, the other people yes. that one, if you look at 18th dynasty royal mummies or 19th mm -hmm. dynasty, they're much sparer. Exactly. But um, maybe possibility of a double chin here. Yeah, <laughs> it could be that that's why it's been it's pushed kind of out. crashed a little bit. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't look what I would call svelte by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. But the pharaoh's body does look like Ramses had a few more feasts than the one that fateful night. History tells us he lived well. Figuring out how he died is another story. Susan has established motive in this investigation, a queen's ambition for her son. Now she's looking for opportunity. How to kill a king and not get caught. Ramses wasn't an easy man to ambush. During his rule, Egypt beat back wave after wave of ruthless invaders. Egyptologist Ian Shaw, a leading authority on ancient warfare. Ramses III had to deal with, with a much wider range of, of uh, military threats than, uh, than any of his predecessors had had to. And, yeah, in fact, um, probably more, more, more of a range of threats than anyone after him as well. Ramses had to overcome one of the toughest military challenges imaginable, a two-front war. As commander, he divides his army and moves his forces from one defensive front to another. Nobody previously had, had, had been under attack from uh, both the uh, west and the east at the same time. This um, must have, have stretched resources uh, quite, quite significantly. The Libyans attacked first from the west, but the greatest threat came from the northeast by a group called the Sea Peoples. The Sea Peoples represented a coalition of armies from the Mediterranean and Aegean. These 
invaders didn't want the spoils of the land. They wanted the land itself. This was actual um, conflict with people who were desperate to find, find land. So that there would have been much more of a sense of Egypt being actually under siege itself. You almost get the, the, the sense of Egypt fighting for its existence. When Ramses looked to the sea, he stared at a formidable force, thousands of enemies, and possibly the end of an empire. This was certainly a, a turning point for Ramesses III, particularly the idea of, of having to um, fight a, a sea battle, which was something that, that essentially the Egyptians had, as far as we know, never, never had to seriously do before. Ramses answered with pure tactical brilliance. Knowing he'd be crushed in a battle at sea, Ramses enticed the sea people's ships into the mouth of the Nile. Then he sprung his ambush. Egyptian archers devastated the enemy with volley after volley of deadly arrows. He defeated the Sea Peoples before they could ever touch land. And he turned back the Libyans from the west. But he never saw the betrayal in his own house coming. Closer look, Susan goes to Thebes and the scene of the crime. Ramses Temple, Medinet Habu. This massive complex of stone and mud brick was known as the mansion of millions of years. The defensive wall that surrounds the temple is 10 meters, nearly 40 feet thick, and the ornate buildings house 75,000 square feet of decorated surfaces. This is the Eastern High Gate and the main entry into the temple compound. And there, right above, are the harem apartments, uh, a very extensive uh, living quarters of the harem women, and the place where the king dallied with his women, and I think the place where the coup and the conspiracy and the assault on the king actually took place. Ramses had palaces throughout Egypt, each with its own harem. The main function of the harem was, of course, the entertainment and pleasure of the king. These were royal palaces. In ancient Egypt, the word harem meant secluded ones, but it could also mean prison. And that's just what it was. The Pharaoh's wives and concubines were considered his property. They lived under a 24-hour lockdown and had virtually no contact with the outside world. You really get a sense of uh, how isolated the women are just by the architecture of the complex itself. It's far removed from the king's palace and the temple. The women who lived here developed great skills as weavers, entertainers, and companions. There uh, was uh, definitely a whole economy uh, that revolved around these harem palaces. They were thriving estates, and they were quite productive in terms of producing linen and garments. But their most important job, to encourage the king's sexual desire and guarantee a healthy bloodline so the dynasty continued. The majority of uh, the harem women had sexual 
responsibilities to the king. Uh, the king was called the great bull, the, the great procreator. Many pharaohs had a great number of offspring, uh, many by these women of the harem. Since children often died in infancy, having many offspring increased the odds that a king would have a healthy heir. One famous pharaoh fathered more than a hundred children. Having many children helped the line of succession, but created fierce sibling rivalries. The pharaoh's many wives all lived in luxury. They wore the finest linens and jewelry. They bathed in expensive oils and had an endless supply of intoxicating fragrances like myrrh, frankincense, and jasmine. Most importantly, being part of the harem guaranteed burials and tombs that brought safe journeys into the afterlife. Some wives were hand-picked for their beauty. Others were foreign princesses given as gifts. All lost their freedom. And nearly all accepted their fate. But Redford thinks the Medinet Habu harem was different. She believes there's enough evidence to prove the harem actually murdered Ramses. Now she wants to figure out how they did it. For centuries, Ramses' mummy was lost to the world. Then, in 1881, archaeologist Emile Bruch discovered Ramsey's body in a secret cache of 40 royal mummies. They moved the mummies to Cairo to unwrap and examine them. The team estimated that Ramses III lived to 65 but reached no conclusion on what killed him. In the 1960s, an American Egyptologist x-rayed Ramsey's body, and Susan wants Salima to take another look. Susan wants to know if an assassin murdered Ramsey's in a violent fight. If Ramsey's had suffered a blow to his head, his x-ray should show trauma. But Salima doesn't see those signs. I have looked at these x-rays of Ramses III to see if there was any kind of trauma that we could see on the bones. But um, none of the x-rays showed anything that might be construed as trauma of any sort. So if he were murdered, then it couldn't have been by a blow to the head or anything else. So the x-rays eliminate the trauma theory. But there are still plenty of other ways to murder an unpopular king. Spring, 1155 BC. Egypt was breaking down. And the aging pharaoh was losing touch with his kingdom. Ramses had uh, amassed great riches. Uh, he even tells us in his palace he dined off um, cutlery of fine gold and, and silver. His treasury was full. But the people of, of Thebes were obviously not getting fed. So, of course, this would not make him a very popular king at this period. Desperate times inspired desperate measures. The unpaid workers decided to take action. They staged the world's first recorded strike. The supervisor of the day book records that all work stopped on this day. The men scaled the walls and headed for the palace. The texts tell us what they said. It's because of hunger that we have been driven to this. There's no clothing, no oil, no fish, no vegetables. Send to Pharaoh, our good Lord, concerning this. 
Some of the pharaoh's wives have close family ties to the villagers. And word of the strike reaches the harem in Medinet Habu. The growing hostility provides the opportunity Queen T's been waiting for. Egypt's economic collapse creates the perfect environment for igniting rebellion. Queen T discreetly recruits conspirators among the other women of the harem. Together, they devise a way to communicate with the outside world. Virtually every day, laborers come to the palace to work or deliver supplies. The harem develops allies among the workers to send messages in and out of the palace. The ancient record tells of one secret note. Get people together incite hostilities in order to provoke rebellion against their lord. The women recruit professional soldiers, including a commander whose sister is part of the harem, to lead the rebellion outside the palace gates. If all goes according to plan, the soldiers will take over the palace after the pharaoh is murdered and make sure Queen T's son assumes the throne. All these things, I think, came together and coincided to lay the groundworks for this coup d'etat. They were going to get rid of the king, and they were going to do it right here. As the moon rises high in the sky, the celebration is in full swing. Ramses relaxes in the splendor of Medinet Habu. Oblivious to the traitors and the desperation of his people. His enemies have him surrounded. Now, they wait for Queen T's sign. As Ramsey's celebration winds down for the night, Queen T's coup picks up momentum. She puts her plan to murder the Pharaoh in play. The first weapon, magic. T summons the court magician Prekamenef to cast spells over the palace guards. The Egyptians very much believed in the power of magic, and they really felt they couldn't go forward without some magical incantations to confuse people. Egyptians believe the gods protect the pharaoh, so an assassination requires magic. They think sorcerers have the power to reverse decapitations and bring inanimate objects to life. Prekamenef prepares small wax figurines, which he'll use as voodoo dolls. The magician and the conspirators believe these dolls will immobilize the palace guards. Now, all the pieces are in place. Prekamenov casts his spells. As the recruited soldiers organize their men in the shadows of the palace walls, magic fails to disable the guards. 
Instead, the sentries turn back the insurgents and capture most of them. The Pharaoh's guards crush the rebellion. Inside the palace, the harem's murder plot moves forward, unaware of the failed attack outside the palace walls. But the big question remains, what weapon did the wives use against Ramses? Poisons would have been a likely option. They were often used as medicines and would have been in the palace. The Egyptian pharmacopoeia is, is chock full of resins and poisons that, that the Egyptians used uh, quite liberally. Uh, they were quite aware of, of the dosage it would take to um, put someone in a coma, say. Mandrake, for instance, a poisonous plant often added to wine to cure insomnia. Too much mandrake, however, brings about a permanent sleep, and eating the fruit from a mandrake plant kills in less than an hour. Poppies, which produce morphine, were just as common, just as medicinal, and just as deadly. An overdose causes paralysis, coma, and ultimately, death. Egypt also had a ready supply of the castor oil plant. Every Egyptian knew of its healing effects. They also knew that the castor oil plant contained deadly ricin, just a few seeds, then as now, can trigger fatal respiratory failure. And rounding out the menu of deadly options was nightshade. It still grows wild in Egypt, producing toxic berries that can impair the human nervous system. The harem had an embarrassment of deadly riches to poison Ramses and Queen T had important allies among the king's personal attendants, people who had access to his food and drink. The records indict the palace's pantry chief, Pai Bakamana, as Queen T's main co-conspirator. Ramses probably doesn't even know the pantry chief's name, but Pai Bakamana controls everything the pharaoh eats and drinks. Pai Bakamana, alone in the kitchen, could discreetly pour a deadly dose of mandrake or nightshade into a goblet of wine. As Ramses retires to the sanctuary of his harem, the women ensure that poison is the last thing on his mind. Eventually, one of the wives innocently hands the wine to Ramses. Redford doesn't buy it. She thinks the poison theory is flawed. For one, many of the poisons have a bitter taste, so Ramses might have rejected his first sip. Second, the records indicate Ramses died slowly. Most poisons kill quickly. He survived, uh, we know he survived at least um, two weeks, possibly two and a half weeks. So if the wives didn't use poison, they must have resorted to something else. Maybe they chose something that was just as deadly, but killed more slowly. Snake can be a chillingly effective assassin's tool. 
and it might have been the perfect choice to kill Ramses. But how do you smuggle one into the palace? And how do you get it to bite the pharaoh? It would have been quite easy to convey a poisonous snake into the harem quarters. Uh, snake charmers abound in Egypt even today. Um, they can actually, um, by handling the head of the snake in a certain way, um, cause the snake to be very stiff. Hitting the right pressure point can turn a writhing snake into a straight arrow, so straight that it can be tucked into a sleeve and smuggled past palace guards. Dr. Zoltan Takac, a research scientist at the University of Chicago, has his own view about which type of snake would have been best for the assassins. If in fact this whole killing happened by a snake or snake venom, then I would tend to believe that the culprit was carpet viper. It's easy to find a carpet viper in the desert. Even today, this species kills more people than any other snake in Africa. At barely two feet long, it's a ready-made murder weapon. It's a tiny little snake, but it's very, very aggressive and the venom is very, very toxic. A couple drops can kill you. Actually, from the carpet viper, it has been estimated that all you need is about three milligram of venom. Viper venom wreaks havoc on the body. It ruptures the blood vessels, makes uh, blood leak into the tissues. You start to bleed internally. You can bleed from your gums, you can bleed in your GI system, in your gastrointestinal system, and you can bleed from old scars. So it's, it's a pretty bad uh, scenario. And in more severe cases, you can have bleeding in your kidney or even in your brain. If one of Queen T's accomplices could sneak a carpet viper into the palace, the harem could make sure it had a close encounter with the pharaoh. With so many wives, it's hard to keep track of everyone. It just takes one to slip treachery under the covers. So Ramses returns to his chambers after a long night of celebration. He doesn't want bodyguards here, just the wife he's decided to spend the night with. The only thing on his mind is pleasure. The only thing on her mind is murder. Snake bite will not kill you instantly. It needs time for the components of the venom to exert their effects, but it can be as long as like a week, two weeks, or sometimes even more. Susan Redford knows that Ramses died a slow death. The snake is murder weapon theory makes sense. She also identifies important clues in the court records. The curious thing there is that two conspirators who, who took leading roles in the conspiracy, uh, one is given the name the Snake, the other is called the Lord of Snakes. There's one other clue, an amulet suggesting Ramses was actually bitten by a snake. There is this um, very small amulet uh, which was found that actually says that Ramses' arms are coated by the sun god Ray against the bite from a venomous snake. Oh, yeah. Isn't 
Isn't that marvelous? That is so cool because that does, in a way, argue for someone who There's, has lived post snake bite. The other interesting thing about this amulet is that the wearer um, is supposed to apply it to his hand mm -hmm. and it is a protection for the bedroom. That's very uncanny. If when we're going to poison someone, uh, something in their food would be less, you know, it would be much more suspicious. Whereas a snake that would wander in from, from the garden in the areas where they mm -hmm. lived stands mm -hmm. a much better chance of A, sneaking in and then mm -hmm. being regarded as a natural mm -hmm. disaster mm -hmm. that had befallen the king rather than something that was exactly. particularly planned. Exactly. There's no question that Ramses had a connection to snakes. Even the lid of his sarcophagus had a carving of a deadly viper. The case for assassination by snake seems very strong. Still, the 3,000-year-old records don't yield all the answers. There's no mention, for instance, of what happened to Ramses in the hours after the assassination attempt. The record, however, tells us exactly what happened to the conspirators. The king's guards rounded up all the suspects. They tortured them for information and confessions. And one by one, the members of the harem conspiracy broke. A crime against the Pharaoh was a crime against God. 33 insurgents, including Prince Pentaware, Queen T's son, the court magician, the pantry chief, the commander, and the two snake charmers faced the charge of high treason, an offense punishable by death. The harem women don't escape scrutiny either. They're taken into custody. At the trial, an official scribe records the entire proceedings on a papyrus. High offense, such as treason, requires judgment from the gods. And communicating with the gods requires priests, the high priests of Amun. They alone decide the fate of the alleged assassins. They are the real power in this trial and are emerging as a potent force across Ramses' Egypt. The priests go through a 10-day ritual cleansing before the hearing. They were shaved um, completely, no hair, dressed in fine linen garments, and even were told they were given little pellets of natron to cleanse their breath as well. have taken a little something extra, hallucinogens, to help them speak to the gods. This trial has no cross-examinations, burdens of proof, or legal niceties. Here, the ornate gold idol plays judge, jury, and appeals court. To address the oracle, the bark was brought in. A procession around the court would have taken place. At one point, the bark would stop, and the question would be presented to the god. And it would be in the form simply of a yes or no answer. Should this person be given the death penalty? Is he guilty? A trembling oracle means the gods are ready to speak. If it moves forward, the gods say yes. Backwards means no. It's 
suppose you can liken it to a Ouija board where certain people who, who like to address the Ouija board um, swear up and down that they're making no movement of the piece as it moves and answers their question. Just like a Ouija board, the players control the outcome. And these players weren't feeling generous. The verdicts? Queen T's son, Prince Penaware, sentenced to death for inciting rebellion. As royalty, he escapes the public humiliation of execution. He quietly commits suicide by taking poison. Prekamenath, the court magician, guilty of the treasonous use of black magic. He opts for suicide as well. Pai Bakamana, the pantry chief, guilty of colluding with Queen T in the harem. The oracle condemns him to public execution. In all, 33 conspirators die. The oracle decrees they must be burned, alive, in a public spectacle. Officials scatter their ashes over heavily traveled dirt roads, destroying any hope of an afterlife. It's the ultimate degradation for an Egyptian. And the absolute opposite of what Queen T intended. That's not the end of the story. The desperate women must now try to save themselves, and time is running out. on the conspirators. The women attempt a last ditch effort to avoid execution. They turn to lust. The wives seduce four court officials, including two judges, a bailiff, and a police chief, in an effort to gain leniency. They have a secret rendezvous, but are caught in the act. The papyrus doesn't give us a tell-all account but does tell us this much. They had a fine party down there. Their misdeeds seized them. The men are found guilty of mingling with the prisoners. Their punishment comes swift and harsh. Executioners lop off the officials' ears and noses. Now Queen T and her cohorts have run out of options and they won't even have the benefit of a trial. They certainly would not have had a public trial, if any trial whatsoever. This, these were the king's property, so none of this the royal dirty laundry would have been aired for the public. There's no more mention of the harem and the papyrus. They simply vanish. It's a long shot, but Susan Redford thinks an unidentified tomb might explain the fate of Queen T and her accomplices. 
The Valley of the Queens is a vast burial ground for Ramsay's family and other royal wives and children. The royals commissioned their own tombs. Size, location, and decor all reflected status. Oh, it's marvelous. There's a cartouche. Queen Isis's tomb has all the trappings of power. Uh, was it difficult to get? The vulture feathers on her headdress signify her importance and standing as chief wife. But not all tombs are created equal. What I think we have is uh, the tomb of Queen Isis and her offspring up through this main thoroughfare. And off on this peripheral valley, we have possibly Queen T and her offspring. This unfinished chamber sits off to the side, and that's why Susan thinks it might belong to Queen T. Yeah. Very curiously. I'm impressed by how close it is to the three princes' tombs. Um, it is right next to uh, a queen of Ramses II as well. Um, it seems to have been fully excavated, and the decoration was begun. It, it has been uh, investigated to a certain extent uh, because um, it's, it's been documented that it does belong to a queen, but uh, that's as far as they know. No, what, be interesting in its own right. Yeah. This tomb may be empty because its owner died before her time. Oh, look. Another. Another. Violently, on, in disgrace. In yeah, that's nice. At Medinat Habu, Susan sees more signs in the reliefs of Ramsey's family. One drawing in particular depicts a beautiful queen. But something's missing. The queen has no name, no identity. This might be Queen T. Nearby, there's another nameless image. Only this one is a prince. Perhaps it's Queen T's son, Prince Pentaware. Robbing an identity is the supreme punishment for an Egyptian royal. It also means there's virtually no chance for an afterlife. Definitive answers can't be found among tombs and incomplete court records. We can deduce what might have happened from the bits of history we do have. What is clear is that Ramses lived long enough to appoint 12 judges to his own murder trial. But he didn't live to see the verdicts. He died about two weeks after the harem's assassination attempt. Killing Ramses was the only part of Queen T's plot that succeeded. Everything else was a disaster. The rebellion failed, and all of Queen T's allies paid with their lives. Queen Isis's son, Ramses IV, succeeded his father as originally planned. His six-year reign was undistinguished, except for one thing. Ramses IV commissioned the record of Queen T's betrayal, so the story of his father's murder would survive. But he and his heirs couldn't keep their grip on absolute rule. A new power was on the rise. The Amun priests seized the influence the pharaohs lost. They emerged as Egypt's ruling class just 100 years after Ramses' death. of pharaohs and their harems was over. And Egypt's 1,500-year reign as the world's great superpower came to an end. <laughs>